Welcome again. And this session, we're going to be reading Mark chapter 10. In this, in this uh, chapter, we're going to be talking about divorce, what Jesus said about divorce. He's going to be talking about the little children. He's going to be talking about the rich and the kingdom of God. Jesus predicts his death at a certain time. The request of James and John and blind Bartimaeus receives his sight. So let's get right into this. Uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 1. He arose from there and came into the borders of Judea and, and beyond the Jordan. Multitudes came together to him again. As he usually did, he was again teaching them. So Jesus loved to teach. Pharisees came to him, testing him and asking him, is it lawful? In other words, is it according, is it according to the Torah? Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Verse 3, Jesus said, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a certificate of a divorce to be written and to divorce her. But Jesus said, For your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And that is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. For this cause, a man will leave his father and mother and, and, and will join to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Now, let me just say this here very quickly. When Jesus was asked about marriage, now in this day and age, uh, especially in much of the developed world today, people don't want to talk about this kind of stuff because it's like we are too spoiled as a... Uh, as a people, uh, society, we're too spoiled. It's like pleasure, 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 pleasure. And I understand, uh, I've heard that, you know, historically speaking, that's the way it was back in these days that they would have, they would get married. Oh, we'll marry her. Oh, I'll divorce her the day after. Oh, I'll marry her. Maybe I'll divorce her after a week. Oh, I'll marry her. I'll divorce, you know, and so on and on and on it goes. It's just not very good at all. So when they asked Jesus about it, the first thing he said about marriage, okay, the first thing he brought out, he said, look back to the beginning. Look back to the Garden of Eden. Look back to the way God really created it, originally created it. He created them male and female. That's God's will. That's God. God Jesus pointed to the ancient scriptures as we've all how many Bible it says by there's more Bibles in the world than any other book and there are more Christians and, and especially in at the recording of this video are people who claim to believe the book of Genesis more than any other I mean more than any other account like that it's just so we we we've got all the resources we've got all of the information here. And Jesus said, oh, you want to talk about marriage? More or less, look back to Genesis. Look back to the way God created it at the be in the beginning, okay? So verse 6 again, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. So Jesus is like, hey, you want to talk about marriage? There's your example. Verse 7, for this cause, a man will leave his father and mother and, be and will join to his wife. Okay, why does it say a, a, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife? Because, you know, the males, the men will, uh, they being the stronger, you know, generally speaking, than, than the females, the female, the men were the ones who usually would, were, were the ones who were able to work and in, in, in earn a living in those days. And the females were not. The females needed a man. You know, you wouldn't have a, it wasn't, they didn't have the industrial revolution like we've had, okay? They didn't have easy work like we do so much today. It was hard, 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 hard work. And most of the ladies would just not engage in the hard work. That was, a, that was what the men did. The men's responsibility was to do the hard work. So the men were the ones that were the breadwinners, so to speak. And the, the women uh, would be either one, you'd be uh, dependent upon your father, 
or two, dependent upon your husband. So uh, the man could leave his father and mother and still survive, but the woman couldn't. So the man left his father and mother and to be joined to his wife. Okay, It doesn't say the wife leaves the father and mother and to be joined to the husband. It doesn't say that. It says the man to the wife. Okay, And the two will become one flesh. How is that? One flesh does not happen by signing a marriage certificate or signing a marriage license. Or it, it, one flesh does not happen. It's not a magical thing that happens when you put ink on a paper or toner on a paper, whatever, you, whatever it is, okay? One flesh happens when the two become literally one, where there's intimacy there, okay? And so they, are, they become one. And, um, and so it says right there, they're... The last half of verse 8, so they are no longer two, but one one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let, let no man separate. Okay, so um, it says here in verse 10, In the house his disciples asked him again about the same matter. He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife marries another, commits adultery against her. If a woman herself divorces her husband uh, and marries another, she commits adultery. Okay, so... You got to look at it also, as I said before, in context here. Uh, the the scriptures speak a lot, and the Torah speaks a lot, and history throughout the Tanakh. We see many different instances of a man having multiple wives, but not a man, not a wife having multiple husbands. That's just not what we see in the scriptures. So uh, it is considered to be adultery for a woman to have multiple husbands that are alive. You know, multiple people that through that she has been married to, through uh, by whom she became one flesh, with whom she became one flesh, still alive, she commits adultery. But if a man has multiple wives still alive, that is not explicitly condemned as adultery in the scriptures. Okay, when whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. Now, obviously, this is talking about another woman, uh, presumably, or, you know, at least possibly another woman who's been divorced from her husband. Um, And so, obviously, it's not forbidden in in the Torah for a man to have more than one wife because it says in the Torah, for example, if a man has more than one wife, you, uh, you're you not to favor the child of the favorite wife over the child of the unfavorite wife if the child of the favorite wife is not the firstborn. You not you don't give that one the firstborn privilege over the one of, that's the wife that's hated. You know what I mean? So it tells you how to manage wives, so to speak, as opposed to, um, you know, anything like other than that. But, we see many times when, let's say, you know, David and many other patriarchs uh, did have more than one wife. You have wife, you have a concubine, which is like a, is like a second-class wife. You have wives, which are like first-class wives, and the concubines, which are second-class wives. And a lot of these uh, men would have a whole lot of not only just wives, but concubines as well, which are like second-class wives. It uh, doesn't say that, th- that they are adulterers, that they committed adultery in doing so, uh, if you look at it specifically. And also in, in the context of Jewish history, uh, it is in, in Jewish history uh, that uh, after, in this, after the time of, of uh, Jesus here and before, let's say, the 6th century, uh, the, the Jewish rabbis and Jewish leaders had to make a rule saying, okay, we'll only allow four wives now, okay? Uh, because there was just, it was just so, uh, I don't know, extreme, I guess, or abused. Uh, and this is, that's, that's where the whole idea of four wives came and, and the Muslim population picked it up in the, like the 7th century and such on like that. Uh, they got a lot of these ideas uh, apparently from their uh, from the Jewish people. So, um, yeah, so this is very uh, important. And this is another huge subject. I'm just giving you just giving it to you, giving it to you in a nutshell. And I encourage you to listen to it humbly. 
uh, and to uh, to research what I'm saying, uh, not research whatever what man says about it, because everybody's got their own biased opinion. But uh, research it from the scriptures and try to ask God. Just say, Lord, let me read. Show me. Try to ha- try to help me to divorce myself right now from this from this culture, because you know every every di- every culture in the world is, is different, and it's so easy to. Um, associate your culture with God or just somehow assimilate God into your culture or your culture into God to think that the way marriage is in in your law today is the way God wants it to be, that is a mistake, okay? Uh, Man's law is a whole lot different than God's law, as Jesus said. So, yeah, a lot of people are not able to do it. A lot of people are not able to read the Bible and just kind of divorce themselves from all, every influence that they've ever had in their life and just say, let me get into this influence, get into the scriptures alone and see what the real, real truth is here um, and, and, and try to put everything else aside, every other idea, every other preconceived idea, everything else, every other bias aside and just look at it for what the, trip, the scriptures truly say. This is what we're talking about here. Um, we don't want to talk about personal opinions or any kind of per, any kind of other teaching. We are talking about what does the scriptures truly say here. This is what this whole thing is all about. And I, like I said, this is a huge subject. There's a lot more to say about it, and I just I just don't have the time or space to say about it to talk about it right now. But uh, there's a little nugget for you. Verse thirteen: They were bringing him to him little children that he should touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who were bringing them. But when they saw it, he was moved with indignation and said to them, Allow the little children to come to me. Don't forbid them. For God's kingdom belongs to such as these. Most certainly I tell you, whoever will not receive God's kingdom like a little child, he will in no way enter into it. He took them into his arms, blessed them, and laid his hands on them. A few things I want to say about this. Notice how it says that Jesus was very angry, indignant, moved with indignation that they would try to keep him, keep the children from him. Notice how it says uh, in verse 16 that he took the children in his arms, blessed them, and laid his hands on them. Now, do understand that there are extra biblical documents, historical documents that that say that certain, there are certain, what should I say now? There are certain people uh, in scripture, certain characters that we read about and certain people in history that claim to be one of these children grown up. And we're going to get into all this, okay? This is just, here's just a little, smell the coffee. You're going to get the full course meal here and just stick with me, all right? We're going to get into all the books of the scriptures, all the books of the Bible. We're going to get into all of the extra biblical books that that pertain to this stuff. We're going to get into lots of awesome things here. So, yeah, you're going to hear more here than you ever will in any Bible school in the world, okay? Verse 17, as he was going out into the way, one ran to him, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? I said this before in the book of Matthew. This would be the most perfect, I, this would be the perfect, perfect, the perfect time for Jesus to say, What you should do to inherit, inherit eternal life is just believe in me. Just accept me as your Lord and Savior. Just kneel right down here, right in front of me right now, and let's say the sinner's prayer. Honestly, this would be the perfect time for Jesus to say that, if that were the truth. Look, listen again. This is, the, this is the question to Jesus. Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus could have said, all you got to do is say the sinner's prayer. All you got to do is just accept me as your Lord and Savior. All you got to do is just, just believe in me and you're saved. All you got to do is accept me and confess me as Lord and you're saved. Or he could have said, Right now is different, but after I'm, you know, crucified and risen again, after that, you know, it's coming a different way because you're going to be alive at that time. You're going to be alive at that time. So I'm going to give you a heads up on how things are changing. 
I'm here to tell you, friend, I'm here to tell you, things did not change. The word of God is forever settled in heaven. Jesus is the personification of the word of God. Never changes from beginning to end, from the beginning of all creation to the end of the world. Never changes. What did, what, what did Jesus say about the way to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to, said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except one, God. Know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. By the way, Jesus was quoting from the Torah, Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5. He said to him, teacher or rabbi, I have observed all these things from my youth. Jesus, look, look, looking at him, loved him. I find it very interesting. It says here that Jesus loved him. It specifically pointed out the fact that Jesus loved this, him, loved him, loved this man, him. There are many times that it does not say that Jesus looked at somebody and loved them. In fact, you may think the opposite by the way that Jesus responded to some people and what Jesus called some people and how he, uh, how he was with some people. You know, telling Judas it would be better if he had not been born. Telling some people, you are the children of the devil. You think you're the children of God? You think you're the children of Abraham? Your father is Satan. Doesn't it say he looked at him and loved them. But here it says, Jesus looked at him and loved him and said to him, one thing you lack. Go sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me taking up the cross. That's complete and utter death Jesus is talking about, okay? That's what he's calling him to. He's calling him to complete self-denial, complete denial of everything. Verse 22, but his face fell at that saying. In other words, he got, he got sad. He was like, oh man, why'd you have to say that? And he went away sorrowful. For he was one who had great possessions. He was a rich man. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it is for those who have riches to enter into God's kingdom. The, the disciples were amazed at his words. Why would, this, why would the disciples be amazed? Because he, they, you know, they're probably thinking, well, Abraham was rich. Solomon was rich. Some of the patriarchs were very rich. We got Rich King David, King Solomon, you know, all these kings and these patriarchs that are rich. You're saying that they, it's very, very hard for them to get into the kingdom of heaven. I thought that this is a symbol. I thought this was a sign of God's, you know, favor upon you, that you're rich, that you're blessed. But Jesus answered again, children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches now, see, he specifies it there. Trust in riches to enter into God's kingdom. For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into God's kingdom. Now, I've heard it said this, and you can decide uh, the validity of this statement, but I've heard it said that the needle's eye, or the eye of the needle, was actually a gate in Jerusalem that was a very narrow gate. And you couldn't take it, you, a, a camel could not enter in through, through that gate, through the eye of the needle, uh, without first being stripped of everything it had. Like you had to, you'd have to take off all of the baggage on the side of the camel, you'd have to take off everything, and the camel could just barely squeeze through there. And so basically Jesus was saying in this context that you must be stripped of all of your earthly possessions. You must be able to put everything down and to come into, enter into God's kingdom, almost like the same way that you entered into this world, you know, with nothing, you know, coming in with nothing. Verse 26, they were exceedingly astonished, saying to him, 
then who can be saved? I mean, if, if what you're saying is true, who can be saved? I mean, man, it seems like a lot of people were rich that were apparently men of God, but who can be saved if it's that hard? Jesus, looking at them, said, With men it is impossible. It's impossible to be saved. But not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to tell him, Behold, we have left all and have followed you. Jesus said, Most certainly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or land for my sake and for the sake of the good news, for the sake of the gospel, But he will receive 100 times more now in this time, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and land with persecutions. Gotta love that one, right? With persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and last first. God is kind of like the God of inversion, isn't he? He takes the humble, the ones who are really lowly, and he sets them on high. He takes those who have, who have pride, who have exalted themselves, and he will knock them down and crush them. The God of inversion. Verse, verse 32. They were on the way, going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going in front of them, and they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. He again took the twelve and began to teach and began to tell them the things that were going to happen to them, to him, excuse me. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn, condemn him to death. They will deliver him to the Gentiles and will deliver him to the Gentiles. They will mock him, spit on him, scourge him, and kill him. On the third day he will rise again. Notice he says here, they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. A lot of people just just blame the Jews for it, you know? No, no. They will mock him, spit on him, scourge him, and kill him. And on the third day he will rise again. Verse 35. James and John. That would be Yaakov and Yochanan, the original Hebrew names. I suppose if you were to go back in the time machine and start calling them James and John, they'd have no clue who you're talking to. The original Hebrew names, Yaakov and Yochanan, the sons of Zebedee, came near to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we, we will ask. <laughs> what a thing to say to the Lord, right? Verse 36, he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And verse 37, they said to him, Grant to us that we may sit, one at your right hand and one at your left hand in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Hmm. Could this be talking about the cup of crucifixion? Could this be talking about the cup of severe persecution that Jesus endured? And be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. This is obviously talking about death. Being killed for what you believe. They said to him, we are able. Jesus said to them, you shall indeed drink the cup that I drink. And and you shall be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit at my right hand and at my left hand is not mine to give, but for whom it has been prepared. Hmm. You think about that question. Does that mean that they, I mean, it could have been prepared for Moses and Elijah. It could have been prepared for Abraham. It could have been prepared for Abel. Enoch. Can you imagine what question, what they were, what they were asking of him? Can you imagine? It's like, can you displace somebody? We want to be there. You bump somebody out? We want to be there. Yeah, they probably didn't think like that, but it's worth just thinking about anyway. Verse 41. 
when the ten heard it, the other ten of the of the apostles, they began to be indignant toward James and John. Well, of course, I mean, yeah, why? How dare you try to be try to get up there in front of us? Jesus summoned them and said to them, "You know." that they who are recognized as rulers over the nations lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever wants to become great among you shall be your servant. Whoever of you wants to become first among you shall be bondservant of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. See, how many people today want to be served? That's not WWJD. That's not WWJD. That's not what would Jesus do. For the Son of, Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. They came to Jericho. And as he went out from Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, the son of Timaeus, Bartimaeus, a blind man, a blind beggar, was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus, the Nazarene, he began to cry out, saying, Yeshua, son of David, son of David, have mercy upon me. Again, you need to recognize, for those of you who are not very familiar with the Jewish way to look at this, but uh, the term son of David means Messiah. Ask any Jew today that know any, ask anybody who's Jewish that knows anything about the Jewish perspective today in Judaism. Say, is the son of David the Messiah? Is the Messiah, does that mean the son of David? Does, does son of David mean Messiah? They'll say yes. So the term son of David was when, when Barnabas called Yeshua, Jesus, the son of David, he recognized him as a Messiah. The evidence says here, the evidence, all the evidence that we have here is that nobody refuted that Jesus was the son of David. Nobody refuted that fact. Nobody, nobody said, oh no, he's not the son of David. Everybody knew that he was the son of David. Okay, They knew his family. They knew that both sides of his family came through David. But could he be the, the son of David? Here's a little tidbit I want to just throw in here, and that is that in Jewish thought as well, the Messiah is also called the son of Joseph. Isn't that very intriguing? The son of Joseph, the son of David, the son of Adam, the son of man. We know that Yeshua was all three. Jesus, the son of David. Jesus, you son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him that he should be quiet, but, but he cried out all the more, You son of David, have mercy on me. Yeshua stood still and said, Call him. Get him, come here, tell him to come here. They called the blind man, saying to him, Cheer up, get up, he's calling you. What a blessed thing that would be, wouldn't it? He, casting away his cloak, sprang up and came to Yeshua. Yeshua asked him, What do you want me to do for you? The man said to him, Rabboni, which means great teacher, that I, may, that I may see again. Yeshua said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the way. And that concludes our reading of Mark chapter 10. Thanks for listening. May God bless you with rich, rich revelation. You never get bored of the scriptures if you really have the Spirit of God right there illuminating these scriptures. You know, it's like being in a dark... If you, you know, when I experienced this, I thought to myself, you know, it's like a person who has been born in a dark room has never seen light, not even one iota of light, not even one ray of light always in a dark room and they feel the table, they feel the chairs, they feel the walls. They know it's there. But when the Spirit of God really comes in your life after you've repented and invited the Spirit of God in your life, the light comes on 
and you see the wallpaper. You see the color and the grain. You see the stuff that you never saw before. You see the writing on the page, the pages of the of the of the book that you knew it was a book, but you never you couldn't read it. May God give you that revelation that he would show you great and mighty things. Great things that you that you must have special spiritual ears to hear and special spiritual eyes to see. Thanks again for watching. And may the Lord be with you and bless you with his shalom peace. Thanks again.